Hi everyone, thanks for joining today's presentation entitled Insider Threats in the Software Supply Chain. My name is Marie Peters and I'll be moderating today's session. Before we get started, I want to review a few housekeeping items. All participants have entered into this session in listen-only mode. If you have questions, please submit them via the chat panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll try to get as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar. We will also be recording this session. So following the conclusion of this presentation, we'll send you an email with the details where you can find this recording, as well as the slides so you may reference them later or share them with your colleagues. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Brenton Kohler. Brenton has worked on a diverse array of security projects, including those involving penetration testing, code review, and security architecture. As a senior security consultant, Brenton plays a critical role in the development and delivery of Sigital's insider threat and malicious code detection services. Brenton? Thank you for that introduction, Marie. Welcome, everybody. So today, I'm going to be talking about malicious code detection uh, and specifically the insider threat and the software supply chain. Uh, I'd like to start this talk off with a bit, a bit of a definition. So we're going to be talking about mal malicious code today, or for short, malcode. Malware is a completely different uh, bit of software in the world that is commonly talked about, and it's, uh, it's out there, and it's something that you know, we have antivirus and anti-malware solutions to help us solve. I define malware as a bit of software that serves in its entire entity as for some sort of malicious purpose. Uh, that would mean something like a virus, a Trojan, something that's external to your system, and when it's on the system, it's going to, in its entire entity, do something disruptive to the organization or the system. On the other hand, the topic of today's talk is malicious code or malcode, which where I define a little bit differently to be uh, specific bits of code within an, within an application or um, that's on your system or within your organization. And that bit of malicious code uh, may look normal. Uh, it may be a bit of business logic or something that's um, just functioning in the application and is slightly different from the rest of the application. The act actual application itself still serves a legitimate purpose, but there is some sort of function or um, control statement somewhere that's going to cause a malicious problem uh, with the application. So I define that as malcode. It's a little bit different. The other uh, important caveat at the beginning that I like to point out is that this is not a new tool. Um, today's talk is not going to be here. Here's a tool that we want you to go out and buy, and it's going to solve and find all of your malicious code throughout your applications and throughout your application portfolio. Um, I think in an ideal world, uh, what I'm talking about is a modification on a static analysis process. Um, in the ideal world, you would attach a malicious code program to a static analysis process that already exists and possibly is uh, very mature. but we could you know, work on in exactly how you want to plug a malicious code detection program in to your existing processes. But I think the really important point here is that I'm not trying to point out a new tool. It's not going to solve the problem just by buying a tool. Um, but that's not to say we don't use tools to help us out when we do these assessments. So the, um, the primary, let's talk about some motivations here. Um, I feel like it's very easy to talk about external motivations for detecting malicious code in the software supply chain. That, um, that could be um, any offshore or onshore vendor who is developing code for your applications. Um, the problem there, of course, is you might have a legal arrangement with the company to build an application. And once you do that, it is, uh, um, and once they do that, once they build this application, it's going to be given to you possibly as a binary. You might have the agreement to get the source code, but it's going to be given to you, and it's going to be probably plugged into your systems and put into your environment with a very high level of trust. Um, common offshoring vendors um, I have here 
are, you know, common, uh, like Asian countries, Eastern European countries where these vendors exist. Um, and the onshore vendors, even like, you know, just development companies within the United States or within your own country. Now, um, I think it's very easy to point these threats out. Um, you know, any geopolitical foe is always an easy point person or entity to point at for the enemy um, or for somebody who could potentially disrupt your operation. But um, I think uh, we had a, our, our internal CTO at Sigital, his name is John Stevens, uh, pointed out a very interesting fact that came out of data from uh, a recent VSIM participant. And he pointed out that backdoors, and we'll talk about what a backdoor is, um, backdoors are the most common suspicious codes that are found in, in an organization who we work with, um, and they told us this through the VSIM. But the interesting point on that, really, is that it was found in code that was developed not in China. Now, I don't know the full details on where it was developed, but I do think, it, I think it's interesting that, it, you know, the, one of the geopolitical foes of the U.S., it specifically called out it was not them. Um, and I think also this goes, my suspicion on this, let's put it that way, would be that this was an internal uh, backdoors that are left in the code. So employees within your organization, um, possibly disgruntled employees, who are causing this issue. So let's talk about those um, motivation, uh, internal motivations. Uh, you know, recent, well, not so recently anymore, but in 2012, um, there was an employee named Bob. He was actually working for, um, I believe it was Verizon, and he had um, outsourced his job, essentially, to via, like, Craigslist to um, a person uh, in China. And what they did was they actually found that he was, uh, I think, the Internet logs and Internet records, that he was just browsing the Internet um, throughout his workday. Um, whoever this was was um, making a six-figure, a very large six-figure salary, and then taking part of that and paying somebody to do his work for him. Um, another example here um, that I like to point out is uh, an error or um, a possibly malicious code in the JSF framework, which was referenced by uh, HP in the blog post on the um, on the slide. What happened here was uh, they have the ability to, via the output text tag, try to protect you from cross-site scripting attacks by using that tag when you're writing to uh, HTML. The catch on it was if it was within one or two lines of a JavaScript um, block of code, it would actually not perform um, output encoding in the way that it said it was going to. Um, to me, that is so subtle. Um, in the computer science term, off being off by one is easy. Off by two is very subtly, um, possibly malicious in my eyes. Um, but either way, it's a very interesting bug that somebody could be using. And on initial code review of the application, that would not get caught because you're using an output text tag and everybody says, great, you're protecting against cross-site scripting. Take somebody who's thinking a little bit differently about the way these things work to, to catch that. Um, the other internal motivation is something like salami fraud. And I reference on this slide a picture of uh, the movie Office Space, where what was happening was it was a group of, uh, you know, employees, a couple of buddies who became, uh, who were all employees of the same company. And they schemed to steal fractions of a cent um, off of every transaction that a bank was doing. Uh, they ended up getting, well, not getting caught, but they ended up having a huge error in the way that the, the evil little developer uh, programmed it, and he missed the decimal point, and they ended up selling millions of dollars instead of, you know, the fractions of penny over time. Um, but that, that exact attack um, is called a salami fraud, where you're shaving fractions and fractions of, a, of uh, transactions and kind of banking that. There's a couple other examples that were like 1993, there was rental cars in Florida, or 1998, there was a gas station in California. The rental cars in the gas station, it was both very similar um, events where it was related to the gauge that was either pumping the gas or that was, uh, you know, when you go take a rental car back, they say you have to have a full tanker, they charge you $40 a gallon or something like that. Um, they were charging $40 a gallon, but it was because they were misreading the um, car gauge uh, inside the car. So they were doing that intentionally. So they're shaving, stealing money by changing the gauge just a little bit. 
All right, so let's talk a bit about um, the threat that malicious code detection program would go after and some of their unique capabilities. So it's possible to target um, administration and operations, developers, and change build uh, or control management, any of those. Um, specifically, the reasoning we, we would want to target these is administration and operations have a lot of power uh, within the systems that, that run our critical applications. Um, this, such as, you know, system admin credentials, um, direct LAN access, that type of thing. On the other hand, we have the developers who are designing and actually writing the code that do these critical, this critical functionality for, you know, all of our applications. And then, of course, at the bottom, we have the change in build control management. And those folks are possibly repackaging software binaries. Um, they're handling rotation of keys. They are doing things like um, maybe attaching dependencies uh, to the application to make it work in the production environment. Um, and so they have the ability or the unique ability to add additional dependencies, uh, change the keys, something like that. So these are kind of the main threats we want to target or think about as we think about a malicious code program. There's one other um, subtle difference that I want to call out here. And it's specifically around um, a vulnerability and malicious code. Vulnerabilities uh, are something that we've come to, the security industry has come to define very well. Uh, things like the OWASP top 10, the SAN top 25, um, and those types of uh, taxonomies for defining vulnerabilities. Um, we know what that means, um, and we've defined it very well. Uh, in the top portion of this so slide, you can see that in a vulnerability case, we're talking about threats such as um, organized crimes, script kitties, nation states possibly, um, or of those asset pros out there who are pen testing your application. And it's interesting because those are the threats. Um, and what they're doing is they're interacting with your website or the attack surface. And the attack surface possesses vulnerabilities. Uh, and then the threat would later discover those vulnerabilities uh, via launching attacks and exploit them. So the subtle difference to malicious code is that the threat is now the IT admin developer or change management person like we were just talking about, but they have the unique ability to create an attack surface. So they manage and maintain that, let's say, a website, and they are creating um, uh, vulnerabilities or uh, functionality within an application. So they're planting it within it. And then at a later point in time, they are launching the attack that they have created or exercising that attack. So the important uh, subtle point in, in this slide and between these two images is the verbs of the interactions between these entities. So to demonstrate that a bit, um, I have two examples here. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to put this uh, bit of code up on the PowerPoint and if anybody knows what uh, what we're looking at, please type it into the chat window. All right. Yes. Okay. So it is a uh, it's a SQL injection vulnerability. Uh, if a static analysis person, uh, yes, everybody seems to be getting it. Good. 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 All right. So. People can identify this very quickly. I think uh, as an industry, we know what this is. Um, in the static analysis perspective, this is a, a query being, being, being created with external, uh, presumably an HTTP request input, the customer name, and getting concatenated to a string query and then executed on the database. So with the you know, hundreds of answers I just got for SQL injection, which is fantastic, um, everybody knows what that is. We, we've defined that as an industry. Well, a more, let's talk about the alternative then. What are we looking at for malicious code? I'm going to put another example up, and I'll talk through this one in a second, but I'll give everybody a chance to kind of consume this. This is from a web configuration file where the first uh, four tags are the servlet, creation of servlet, and the second that is creating of a servlet mapping to a URL pattern. So if somebody were to hit that URL, they would be directed to the 
servlet specified above. So the interesting part of this, or and what makes this possibly malicious code here, is you know looking at this. This is perfectly normal functionality. There are often many different types of servlet servlet in a web application, but the subtle error or potentially malicious code here is the fact that the second servlet is pointing to possibly what might be the, a almost near duplication of a spring web servlet, but it's coming to you know a bit a different bit of code, the your organization or the attacker organization bit of spring web code. Um, and what that means is if somebody were to hit the alternate mapping at the very bottom of the slide, they might be going to different code than what um, was reviewed, what was tested. The alt may never have been tested as a part of a, a dynamic application security test. So this would appear, um, just by doing a static analysis or looking at the application in live, you may not notice that there's a second dispatcher servlet handling um, incoming requests. And that's a very subtle difference. Um, it is a bit of normal code that looks that is possibly malicious due to the uh, the fact that it's all that it's directing you to a different bit of code than maybe what you intended. All right, so going back to those um, threats that we were discussing, um, you know, who are we really going to target? Well, in its purest sense, uh, malicious code detection analysis is going to target the developer. You know, there are ways, um, I think, via business process and via technical solutions as well, to target somebody like it, who's in change control and build management or somebody who's in admin and operations. But in its purest sense, and I'll talk about why I mean this, um, but we're going after finding a malicious developer in the easiest way to do it. The Performing a malicious code detection, um, if you were to do uh, higher digital, let's say, to do an analysis, um, the only thing that we require um, to, the, to the process is the binaries. Um, so I've bolded that here. Uh, and our output is suspicious items. Our output is always suspicious items. We are not calling out um, anything that is, this is malicious code. We are saying we are very suspicious of these bits of code. Now, what's going to help us build that suspicion rating and maybe get to a point where, you know, when I get on a call and I say, we found some malicious code, it's going to be because you've given me more information, such as design documentation, or let's just even go as far as the source code to the application. Um, there's a potential that if you get these extra bits of information, it's going to help me build the story or anybody who's doing one of these assessments build the story of what the specific uh, bit of malicious code is doing. So let's say that we got a bit of code um, and we also got the binary. We could maybe build the code ourselves, have a binary, and then compare it to the uh, binary that is given um, to us. And if those two things match up, we might be able to rule out that it was that build control, build and control management, uh, build and chain control management, excuse me. All right, so you know we've talked a little bit um, about who the threat is and what the threat is. We've talked about some of the elements that go into detecting uh, what this is. Um, now we're kind of heading up the methodology, the evolution of this methodology, uh, and we're getting towards. All right, next thing we can start doing is writing signatures, um, and as we do that, it's going to help us build suspicion of malicious code and maybe get towards uh, the intent of that bit of code. So we like to call out a couple of examples of what the signatures are. Um, signatures uh, can be written with a simple regular expression to detect certain subtle changes in the application. Um, things we might be looking for are points where system where an if statement is trying to detect uh, if the current time is greater than a certain time. Um, try to think about reasons why you would ever want to do that. Um, maybe the application flow is going to change significantly after a certain date, but it's very interesting nevertheless to see that. Uh, one of my other favorite ones is finding um, strings in the code that are URLs. And when you find that in the code, typically URLs are stored in a configuration file. 
or in a, at least in a um, well-designed application. So if that configuration file, or if that, um, I'm sorry, if that string was stored in the code as a part of the URL, it might be um, something that either needs to get fixed, or it could be something where somebody's opening a URL connection out to um, a host that was not planned to be open to because it wasn't designed and put into the design doc and put into the configuration file. So this is why adding some of those uh, inputs to the process beyond just the binary helps us build a bigger story. So I'd like to go into the backdoor example that I called out earlier. And this example, the, the, the idea is somebody has inserted a uh, backdoor or a, a separate way to get into um, the application, whether it's, it's not going to be via the main authentication method. It's probably a way to, um, to connect in via, let's say, a network access that is not coming through main authentication. So what that would look like is um, some sort of functionality that is going to uh, open a shell, uh, possibly based on some in-band, uh, like a special control parameter. So they add a parameter to the URL. And when that happens, when that request hits the app, it's going to open up um, a shell access that the attacker can then connect to. Um, what's going to make that even more in, in indicative to us that something is going on is, is that there's some sort of stealth going on. And I, I think if somebody's doing some sort of special parameter that's not being used and you were to catch that, that's going to be increasing suspicion of the stealth. Um, if somebody is opening, uh, if there's a bit of, uh, let's, if there is shell access, for example, um, that's going to be increasing my suspicion. And if they're trying to hide that shell access by maybe putting it across different uh, method calls that's opening it, or uh, you know, doing something like that when they're hiding the tracks within the application and we start piecing those together, it's going to build our suspicion of the application and of that bit of uh, malicious code. All right, so I, I mentioned that it's, it's our main goal is to go after the, uh, the developer, but if if you wanted to go after configuration management and, and or at least rule them out, um, there's some rules here that I would that I would want to point out. And there's also rules here that I think are just going to be helpful for the malicious code detection process in general. And what that is uh, is basically like we we ask for a binary at the very least when we do one of these assessments. And our um, ability to prove suspicion or intent of any bit of malicious code. Uh, is only going to be as good as the binary was to prod, as its proximity to prod. What I mean by that is if we get a copy of a binary that's not the actual production copy, um, there may be some test code that's attached to it. There may be uh, various bits that is removed or not attached, or some of those dependencies for production haven't been included with it. We want as close to production as possible. And that will help us ensure that the actual code that's running in production um, has been reviewed. Additionally, we like to recommend or hope that, ye, that your organization via um, code repositories knows who wrote what code. Um, knowing that is going to be very important, you know, one, to track down any potential issues, um, but also to trace the code um, across history and understand, like, when certain things were introduced, uh, which is going to be very helpful. Uh, additionally, we we think that um, you, utilizing that change control group um, is going to be helpful because you're going to be able to hook MCD in there, possibly get a direct copy from them uh, via maybe like let's say the build script is going to copy off that production binary to a place where malicious um, the malicious code detection uh, unit would pick it up and do the review. Uh, and it also will give you the ability to uh, back out of a potential malicious code that was introduced to a safer version or to a version that you think is going to be safer. Okay, so we've talked about the threat, um, and we've talked about getting towards this, getting towards the idea of the intent of the code. Um, the the problem though is, what do we do now? Uh, and, and the issue is, well, if you were to if you were to send your malicious code report 
down to the developers. And the developer gets it, and that developer is a malicious actor. They are, you've tipped your hat to them. You're, you're now not, I guess, performing good operational security because they now know that you're looking for malicious code. So what they will start doing is trying to evade your detection techniques. So they now know about it. You want to kind of operate as a clandestine operation where they don't know that their applications are getting reviewed in this way, um, which typically in the vulnerability, uh, in the pen test, find vulnerability fix uh, of the you know, common vulnerabilities, uh, it, like OAuth oh, pen vulnerabilities, that is the solution. Um, we go fix the vulnerability. That is it. Uh, but what we're going to say here is there's, that's not the best approach because you don't want to render uh, the collection mechanism that you're, u that you're using um, useless. You, you want to keep it a secret for as long as possible. So um, I think that's a really important point because you, know, you don't want to tip the hat. And so the next question becomes, well, what can we do? Uh, and I think the first point is, well, you can do uh, nothing. And of course, that's what's happening uh, in probably many places when pen testing vulnerabilities are found. You know, there's not a good business justification. Uh, the cost is too high. Uh, the risk is too low. Whatever, we do nothing. And as, hey, at least we know that there's maybe a bit of malicious code. Um, I like the second point because I encourage um, information security groups to have a good relationship with developers. And so verifying suspicion using trusted developers is a pretty cool idea. I think it's hard to implement, um, practically speaking, to truly keep the program secret. But let's say you had trusted developers located throughout your development organization that you could verify the suspicion of the code. That could be very handy in a way to go about it. But getting into the more technical solutions is going to be something like passive monitoring which um, is going to be just simply in instituting logging or firewall rules to detect that if there is a backdoor and data is getting exfiltrated out to you know, an attacker or outside of our organization, we at least know it's happening and know that that bit of code has been executed. You can get into active suppression, which is going to be modifying those rules again, those firewall rules, where we would, um, as an example, where we would uh, prevent that external access and prevent that code from actually getting exfiltrated out of a out of the company or out of the organization. And of course, you know, if you've gotten to the point where you have verified suspicion, you have some active um, attack going on, the data is being exfiltrated. Uh, you are now going to possibly have a very suspicious bit of code, something you know is being executed, and we're going to perform an executive level event, whether that's um, you know, firing somebody or moving them in the organization or, you know, get HR involved, I guess, at that point. Okay, so the, um, in the end here, I have a bit of an example of some code. And what I'd like to do is, as you review this code, type into the chat window um, what you might find um, issues in this code. And if there are any, uh, or actually, if there are any, um, but type into the chat window is what you see here. Um, this code is a on message function that's a part of a message listener. So it's receiving messages to the uh, to this to uh, this bit of code and it's handling them. The first line simply parses the input. All right. So the first thing that we see on the on the real bit of code is it's there's a random number generator that's getting set up. And it's, a, it's calling the java.util random um, API. So to a static analysis person, this is an instant easy finding because it's using the random API. And anytime that we see random API use, we're calling it out as not sufficient randomness because Java util is not sufficient to generate securely random numbers or properly random numbers. So for that, um, that's going to be an instant static analysis finding, and it's very easy to point out. I think common tools for static analysis is going to reference this. So feel free to uh, drop into the chat and say other things that look bad, or if this looks bad at all. But I'm telling you the first finding now is the random generator, um, which is, which is you know, not sufficiently random. That may flag your interest in this code um, as you started reviewing the application from the start.
Does anybody see um, other issues? Yep, okay. So the, the, the second one, yes, exactly, okay. The second one that I got was um, direct use of a print writer to the file system. Um, this is sort of odd. It's, it's opening a file writer to, to, the, to C temp, C colon temp, and writing a test.txt file. I mean, that's not really telling you much about what it's doing, but it's certainly odd to see this. Um, in, in a bit of code because most of the time uh, we're, we're writing applications that handle files in a completely different way than this. They're not going to open it on their own like this. They're going to call some sort of um, some other object that's going to handle files and handle locking on those files. Um, it's not going to open a direct reference right to it and close it immediately um, in the bit of code. So there's some other um, interesting bits in this as well. And it really um, starts off in the multiplier, um, I thought, on this set data call, which is about midway down through the code. So what it's doing here is it's taking a set data, or it's calling set data with the value of the original double value and multiplying it by what essentially is um, 110%. So it's an increasing the application, or this, the application, it's increasing this data by 10%. So what would that be doing? I mean, essentially what we're looking at here is some sort of, um, what I would think of is salami fraud, as I was referring to earlier, where it's increasing data entries by 10%. Uh, now, typically, this type of code is not going to be in an on-message handler. Um, application or business logic is handled, let's say, in a Java B or in, in the control part of the application. Um, or at, I'm sorry, in the model, but definitely not typically in this part that's going to receive the input and start trying to do something with it. It's not going to modify data right there at the very least, if you were modifying data at all. The other interesting aspect of this is really on the, uh, the for loop that's above that, where we start to get into some subtle, uh, let's say, stealth. Because what they're doing is they're lo looping over a count of uh, 1 to 10 and getting from that random number generator that we talked about a value from 0 to 9 and then finding every time that that is divisible by 5 evenly, uh, it will fire off this rule of modifying it by 110%. So what does that do? Well, there's a bit of spell, but it essentially means that every, uh, very frequently, increase the value of this data by 10%. Um, it, it may have been less suspicious if this 10% increase was not inside of this um, pseudo-random every, every bit of time um, doing this, but it, if it was instead, you know, in the proper bit of part of the application, modifying data, and then, you know, handling it normally. But handling it in the on-message function, uh, generating a bad random number generator, doing this you know, close to probably what would be 100% of the time, you know, 1 to 10, and then some sort of the 0 to 9 percentage of that would be a lot. It would definitely work out that this would be increasing by 10% very, very frequently. So these four bits of information about this code would definitely raise our suspicion level, and this report, or this bit of code would show up in a report from us where we would be calling out specifically a bit of suspicious code and this would go through as a very high suspicion rating. Now, what the follow-on steps to this would be goes back to our escalation step slide where it's like we need to verify why this is here, what's going on. I think the easy um, cop-out answer is often that it's testing code of some sort and therefore it should be removed. But that is even gonna be flagged by us so that we do proper due diligence on understanding exactly what this is doing. So at this point, um, this, is, this is the end of the deck that I had. So I'd like to open it up to uh, questions. Feel free to drop them into the chat uh, for any questions you have on anything I went over or if you have other questions about a malicious code detection program. So. 
one of the first questions I got is um, what what tools would we suggest? And I think that's a great great question. Um, we have internal tools that we use to do this type of uh, analysis. Uh, now, uh, various of the static analysis uh, programs out there do uh, flag certain bits of code for malicious uh, activity. Um, I believe um, we, you know, IBM AppScan Source does a bit of that. It will flag things, and they call it malicious trigger, and that's going to flag every operation in the code that is a date-time analysis. Um, which obvious or that calls the daytime API. That's going to cause a lot of uh, false positives. It's definitely going to take a manual review. I think that using any tool uh, that currently does static analysis is going to be very helpful in doing this because it's going to help you write rules to look to seek out specific parts of the application where you can find malicious code. Uh, but there is I don't I don't I'm not aware of any tools for sale on the market, and I'm certainly not selling one yet. Um, that would do this permanently or do it well for for you. So I got a, a, another one here. What is a typical false positive rate? And I think that's a really great question. Um, we the tools that you use are definitely going to generate a lot of uh, of malicious code hits, um, and and there's going to be a lot of false positives. Um, I think it requires, I don't know if I have exact numbers on that information, but I think it's going to require, um, this is always going to require uh, some sort of person doing a review of those false positives. Um, in fact, one of our, our, our main approach is actually to kind of review as much as possible. We want to have a very, very noisy uh, tool response because we want to be flagged to anything that could be possibly um, building that story that we just went through in the example. If we are getting flagged to just date time APIs, we'll go through those. But if you find one that's firing like on a greater than type of requirement, that might then trigger you into that bit of code. But just simply doing those rules, uh, the static analysis rules, is not is probably not going to be enough to build enough of a story to say that we have malicious code. So another um, common question is about uh, third-party APIs that are included as a part of, uh, you know, binaries that are that are deployed. Um, those are certainly reviewable, especially if we get that uh, production binary. It's possible to still look at those. Now, of course, like, as I was saying about the input to our process, those are going to be uh, harder if they're not open source, let's say, because we're only going off the binary. It's going to be hard for us to build the exact story about what that third-party uh, library is going to do in your application. It may have a bit of malicious code in there, but without knowing uh, exactly where it came from, exactly when it was introduced, and you know, even being able to look at some of that code, the actual code before compile time, it's going to be hard to you know build that suspicion um, all the way to the point where we would um, maybe get to intent of what it was of what the attacker was intending to do. That was a question about third-party components. So there's another question on um, certain skills or, or requirements to be able to do an analysis like this. Uh, my thought on it is that I think it requires somebody who can understand and, and write code. Um, I, I think it's a developer-oriented type of position, somebody who has been involved in writing code, understands programming languages, probably goes as far to understand a bit about um, maybe not machine language, but what the Java virtual machine or the .NET virtual machine is doing with, uh, with, the, com with the compiled code, because that's the type of level that we go to when we analyze a binary. We're looking at that lower level uh, representation of the code to try to detect uh, malicious code. So I, I think it requires that developer um, and, and those types of skill sets around a developer or somebody who debugs an application maybe. The tools aren't quite, um, the, the tools in the space right now aren't quite advanced enough to be saying like, this is malicious code and we need to, you know, fire that person because it's definitely malicious. Um, it's more like being able to review the code which is why I was saying it's a modification on the static analysis process. Being able to review that code, 
and then build a story around the information that you've gathered. So I got a question about a bit of the uh, example code um, that I that I put up there. This was um, this was an example code that I I wrote. Um, it was not any production code. It was just a little example um, that I put together just to demonstrate uh, maybe those four elements that are going to uh, build your story for finding malicious code. Just reviewing the questions that are coming in the chat and trying to answer ones that I haven't answered already. So the the tools um, that can help identify this, um, I would say it's anyone that allows you to probably write custom rules. Like I was saying, some of them have um, the ability. Some of them have rules in there already, uh, but I think you you could use something like maybe FindBug, which is free and open source but you're going to want to write your own rules to, to discover these things because I don't believe that it has a, a large enough rule set to be able to discover malicious code. So the approach for um, this, what, what I'm describing is really what we do as a part, as our assessment. Um, the program for this would be more on a business context or a business process where we would say, uh, plug into the building control management and plug into the development, uh, maybe the code repositories, and plug into production so we can get all those artifacts together. And if, it, and if we're talking about a third-party um, bit of code that we've got or a third-party developed um, application, the, the issue with that is we're most likely, and I don't know how frequently um, people get code when they, when they have been developed by a third party, but most, most of the time, I think they're getting binaries that they're putting into production, and we'll still review those, and we'll still give you suspicious um, indicators, and we'll still give you a report with suspicious findings. The problem um, is it gets towards proving um, what the results, or it gets towards proving those results and understanding, like, okay, it was definitely introduced by the third party and not by our production crew. Uh, and it was, and it's almost like gets into a legal question then of how much we need to um, get them to possibly um, do their own investigation or, or get the uh, authorities involved. It's not um, something that's going to be very easy when it's a third party organization. And I think uh, we got another, uh, an interesting question, I think, around how many developers are actively involved in malicious code development? Well, I suppose that depends on your worldview. Um, I think uh, John's point on the you know, second or third slide of this deck where he, or in the tweet he called out, you know, this is not code we're finding in code developed in China. Um, I think that kind of lends to it. I don't think it's that frequent um, that it's truly malicious code internally. Um, I think that there's a classic, um, answer to a question of how likely is any vulnerability or any uh, malicious code to be uh, exploited? How likely is that event? And when we start talking about internal uh, developers, internal employees, we get to a very good question of, well, it's hard to say. Uh, how much do you trust the internal employees? How likely are they to be disgruntled and want to steal money or steal information or have it or, you know, leak it out to somebody else? So I think that that's, um, you know, I, I don't think I can answer how, how many are actively involved, but I think it's possible, and we are finding code that would look malicious. Whether or not it, events have occurred, such as a firing from that, is a whole separate ballgame. So some examples, let's see. I want to think about the examples of rules that might be used to detect a logic bomb. Um, I think something there would be maybe using reflection um, API in Java, for example, where based on some sort of event, it's going to call on different um, application or different parts of the application versus others. Um, I think you know a good example of that could be um, the the example we had in the web config with the two servlets. Possibly, if the one servlet was fired and, and received a request. Um, 
that would then cause, set off some other sequence of events that is going to possibly open that, um, that door, maybe, maybe like the, the shell access or the back door. Um, I would still I would consider that some form of a logic bomb because you're, you're having some external event that's going to completely change the control flow of the application. So I mentioned the law enforcement, and I think that that's a, a kind of an interesting one, getting HR involved and maybe escalating it to law enforcement. Um, is there any history of prosecutions for back doors? Um, I don't know that answer. Uh, I think it's uh, if it's actually found and how many times people have, you know, had a criminal event based upon it, um, who knows? Uh, I, would, I would assume that maybe the companies are, will want to keep that information secret if there's a true backdoor that was exploited where information was stolen, um, especially if it was an internal employee. Uh, the example I called out for those internal motivations uh, where we had that, that employee who was outsourcing his job to China, of course, that was all kept under mostly the, the story came out, but, you know, names and who was involved and exactly what happened as a result of it, that was all kept under well, uh, under wraps. You know, that was kind of kept secret. So I think... Um, that information is generally kept pretty secret, but it would be interesting to know more about, you know, how many times this happened and the exact uh, follow-up actions that occurred. So there's, a, there's a, more questions about the logic bombs on specific types of systems. And uh, I, think all, I think the rules are very similar for all of them. And, you know, I'm not going to go into in various examples for the different languages that are being asked. But I think the point would be to say, all right, if the, what we would look for at least is if the application flow changed via some sort of, um, some sort of external call or internal event like a time, um, we, would, we would flag that and then review the code that's related to it. So there's examples of like um, COBOL and ATM machines. I think it's, um, I don't have examples of the rules we would write, but I think it's the, the higher level of theory, I guess, of what we would do in those scenarios where we would tag some sort of event that's triggering that logic bomb, or at least we would hope we would have some sort of um, rule, uh, a regular expression, let's say, that's going to flag us to that area of the code, and that's going to direct us to the possibly malicious code. So I think there's a good question as well on best practices for ratios of developers to vulnerability detectors or malicious code detectors, for that matter. Uh, I think the BSIM calls out, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to struggle to remember the exact number, but I believe it's something like uh, one infosec to every uh, 10 uh, developers is, is the current number. And I might be wrong on that. It might be, one, might be a little bit smaller of a percentage. But either way, um, that's for InfoSec to developers. I would argue a smaller percentage uh, to do a handle a malicious code detection program because I would want a smaller crew of people who are in my trust circle of people who would get these, this vulnerability information and who would help me escalate the events, uh, identify trusted folks to, to talk with it about. Um, I would want a much smaller crew than maybe even one to 10 All right, so I think I've gotten through uh, most of the questions that were asked, and we're approaching the end of the hour. Uh, if you have additional uh, questions or are interested in learning more, um, please email. Uh, there was just a point in the chat about uh, visiting sigital.com or info at sigital.com, and my Twitter handle was on uh, the first slide of the deck. So I'm, I'll, you know, if you ask me any questions via that, direct messaging or publicly, I will try to respond.